have an added word of prayer. Father, thank you for those words that tell us that all of the scriptures and the works of Jesus and his miracles were testifying that he had life and that he was offering it to each one of us. It's as simple as that. So Lord, help us as we look at this final topic here, help us to see that there are other things that will be placed in the way of life and help us to take them out of the way so we can clearly see Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. This final installment is called Antichrist. And what I mean by Antichrist is not necessarily just the medieval church of Rome. What I mean by Antichrist is in place of Christ. Anti in the Greek means in place of. And so anything that comes in between us and Christ or takes his place, we need to discard that. And so as we go through this, I'm not going to be pointing to anything necessarily particular in your life, but if it comes out that there's something that comes between you and Christ, or that connection is not as strong as it should be, then reconnect with Christ. That is the main gist of this sermon. Take everything out of the way that stands in the way, and focus on Christ. Years ago, Pastor Richard, and some of you might know him by this last name, Von Brandt, or Von Brand, some people call it that, he spent eight years in prison in Romania after testifying, not before some little community college writing class about his paper, but before 4,000 people at the Council of Cults. Can you imagine? There's this communist Council of Cults where they're, where they're looking through and trying to describe different groups of Christianity. That's what they mean by cults. And by diagnosing them as either anti-state or for the state, they would put you in categories. So he stands up before 4,000 of these people whom most of them are saying, Yes, I believe in communism. Yes, I believe, and they're going along with it all. And he stands up and says, brothers and sisters, glorify God and Christ alone rather than communism. Can you imagine being in an environment like that where it's totally against the grain of society, totally against culture, standing for the word of God? Now, we all will have to have examples like that. Well, in 1959, Pastor Richard is turned in by a member of his own house church, and he spends quite a bit of time in prison being tortured, beaten on the legs, and brainwashed through all kinds of recordings that they played over and over again. It got so bad that he could not remember a single scripture. He got so bad where he's like, Lord, I, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And he cried out, and he, the Lord sent him one simple sentence. Jesus loves me. And he focused on that amidst all of the brainwashing. He eventually gets out. He is taken aside by the secret police and told, if you tell the story, we're going to find you and do you in, pretty much. And in 1965 and onward, he begins to spread this story, Tortured for Christ, across the United States. You can get a free copy of the book if you want. And as I read this story, didn't really find anything I disagreed with. There might have been a couple little nuances that were different than what I believe. But other than that, this beautiful testimony, he mentions in this story that the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Romania turned in some of his pastors during that time. And that caused me to pause. Because I'd heard about Germany and some of the things that happened in Germany, but in Romania, here was this communist regime. First of all, there were, the Germans were in that area, and then when the Russians came in, the communist regime came in. And it's at that point that even within our own ranks, they began to turn on each other. Can you imagine being the pastor or the local member, elder, who you feel like you're doing the work of the Lord, and next thing you know, you're kidnapped from your own residence and taken into prison, and you find out later it was your own conference president who used to call you on the phone and have prayer with you. Uh, that would be a terrible feeling, just like Richard, Pastor Richard being turned in by one of his own house church members. And so as you look at the history of our world, this type of behavior has happened. Those who stand, stood firm have sometimes even been betrayed, just like Jesus was. And this is not the first time humans were faced with this choice between right and wrong. We know this is the history of our world, standing for right or going along with the wrong. And we go all the way back to the beginning, don't we, in the garden. So what I'm going to do in just these next few minutes is to chronicle. This is called the Iceberg Chronicles. I'm going to chronicle the iceberg from the beginning of the Bible all the way down. And really what was happening in Romania was just the iceberg complex all over again. There was an undermining of Scripture. 
There was an undermining of the origins teaching. There was eventually you get rid of the messengers, and eventually you put up your own system. It's, it's really how most systems are set up in place of Christianity around our world. And so the devil's method really hasn't changed. We find in Genesis chapter 3, he comes along and says, Half God said. Remember this story? The serpent comes to Eve. Half God said. So he's getting her, has he said this? What's that going to begin doing? It's going to begin to undermine or cause questions regarding the word of God. Is it not? That's his goal. He's already got her lured over there. He's, eventually what we find is even her own words begin to express doubt. And then she begins to add to the words of God. Dangerous ground. Adding our own interpretation. Adding our, we, and some people say, well, that's just your own interpretation. Really? The Holy Spirit should be able to guide us to be on the same page. So she begins to add to the word of God. Neither shall you touch it, is what she adds to it. And eventually, she goes down this road where the devil says, God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you will be like him, as God's, knowing good and evil. God's hiding something from you. So isn't that undermining God? So you undermine his words, you undermine the messenger himself, God himself, and then he introduces the false teaching. You will not surely die. You have life in and of yourself. You will be as gods. When we talked about that, that is the same idea as pantheism, all being God in nature, but then that, since we're part of nature according to the evolutionary cycle, then we're God as well. And that was introduced way back then. And so do you notice the progression? Undermine God's word, undermine God himself, then slip in the false teaching. And this type of scenario has been repeated ever since the garden. I've chronicled it, and next thing you know, she's taking and eating it, Adam's eating it, and really, was Satan satisfied with just conquering this world? No, because eventually he knows, he'll eventually find out the plan of salvation is that God himself would come, take God out. Eventually, we want to expand this out, don't we? I don't think he would be just content with this world. If he had an opportunity, he would eventually take it all over the place and conquer the universe. So he has this as a staging ground. We know in Job chapter 1, he becomes before, the, before God from Roman to and fro on this earth. He has some access at that point. And so what does he want? He wants his own system of worship set up here. And Isaiah and Ezekiel point out he will not be satisfied until he takes God off his throne and places himself on his throne. And God rules the whole universe. So he will not be satisfied until he rules the whole universe. So what we see being played out in the Garden of Eden is really what he's planning to do everywhere from that point on. And so the iceberg, if you want to call it that, that we've been talking about, this whole system of false teachings that is coming before the church, and we need to hit it and knock it down because it's taking us away from Jesus, it really originated back then. Because back then, the goal was to place his system in place of God's system. And we know from Genesis chapter 2 what member of the Godhead is there who we know is Jesus later. So he wants to have his system set up in place of Jesus's. This is the origin of Antichrist in our world. It goes back before that to heaven, of course, the war in heaven, but this is the origin in our world. And so we look at this iceberg we've been looking at. We've, we've looked at how there is an attempt to undermine Scripture in the Christian world today through the higher critical method, but back then it was half God said, so he was undermining it then. There was messenger assassination. God knows you'll be as him, so start doubting the messenger himself. Get him out of the picture. Then the false teaching about origins. Back then it was, you will not surely die. That is a false teaching about origins, meaning you have life in and of yourself. And so then you can start asking the question, if, I'm, if, if I have life, then I've always had life. You start going back to questions of origins as well. And we know God is the originator, originator of life, whereas the devil is trying to teach something else. And then the false teaching about the church is what we're going to talk about more today. There it was, take and eat. Choose this way that I'm telling you to go. And with it comes a whole religion that permeates part of the ancient Near East. And all of this iceberg at the base of it has this here. Instead of Jesus being there, it's a man-made system that takes Jesus out completely. And so this iceberg, this struggle, good and evil, of choices, 
continues all the way through the Old Testament. You have the same thing in the story of Cain and Abel. Not just two brothers, not just God being particular with one or the other. You watch. God is in a conversation with Cain. He knows Cain intimately to have a conversation with him. And what does Cain do? He ignores that. And we've already seen from the story of Cain and Abel, it's in the full, in this series of time or as a time progressed, which most linked to some kind of worship occasion or potentially the Sabbath. And Cain brings the opposite of what he should be bringing. And so we find two systems emerge, one that results in expulsion and going away from the people of God and Abel, of course, his blood crying out for vengeance. So we find the two religions emerge in that day. In Noah's day, do we have it back down there as well? Do we have this idea of undermining the words of God? Well, who's out there preaching for all that time? Noah's out there preaching for all that time. Methuselah, he's out there. I mean, you've got this whole beautiful thing being set up saying, come to me, come to me, I will save you. And can you imagine preachers of that day saying, don't worry, God loves everybody and he'll save everybody. You don't need to get into that boat. That's called universalism. All right, so if God provides a provision, then he means what he says. And if you don't accept that provision, you're undermining God himself. And that is a false teaching that takes away from God. To find out later on, that would even take away. Universalism takes away from the cross as well. Because think about it. If God's going to save everybody, why did Jesus die? If we have life in and of ourselves, why did Jesus die? He died because God wants us to choose freely to worship him. His system is totally opposite from Satan. Satan wants to force you to worship. God wants you to freely choose. And so in Noah's day, we find that. Down at the Tower of Babel, we think of, oh, it was just a time of confusion. That's fine. But Babylon in the Akkadian means gateway to the gods. So what did they have? A whole system of worship. It wasn't just a tower, a flood insurance tower. It was, I don't trust you, God, tower. I'm going to make my, uh, we're going to make our way together. And bet you there was ecumenicalism. I bet you there was. Let's all come together. Let's all build this gateway to the gods. And so we find the struggle continuing there as well, undermining the word of God that began to go against God. Time of Abraham, we find him leaving Ur, which I watched an interesting nature video about that, how Mesopotamia, the beautiful place of Ur, he leaves that, and he goes pursuing a faith in God. And Hebrews makes it clear that Genesis 12, his journey as it begins, was a journey of faith. He is establishing faith in God for himself and his family. In essence, he's restoring worship of God. Time of Jacob and Esau, it wasn't just two brothers fighting again. It's two faiths emerging. And we know that today. Two faiths have emerged from that. Time of Moses, it's not just Moses, a potential prince of Egypt, going against the Pharaoh, it's more than that. Let my people go. Yahweh is coming, and Yahweh is going against the so-called gods of Egypt. It's two sides again. In the time of Moses, we have an interesting story, and we find it in Exodus chapter 32. I invite you to open your Bibles there. And young people, here's your answer for your, one of your questions. Exodus chapter 32. So in every period we find a choice is ours. Will we go along with the culture of our day? Will we go along with what seems popular? Or will we go along with the ways of God? And in Exodus 32, you find the story of the golden calf. Look at verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, which, by the way, it wasn't just him, it was God. We do not know what has become of him. Verse 2, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and have a revival, right? Isn't that what usually happens in the Old Testament? They, they throw away their gods, and they throw away their wealth, and they say, this is, you know, God is God, right? But no, bring them to me. So he brings them to him. And as we see here, so all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a gold molden calf. 
Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so Aaron builds an altar, makes a proclamation, has a holy feast, and they rise up early, and you can see the festivities begin. And how does Moses feel about that? How does God feel about that? <laughs> this is a pretty serious time. Moses gets down there, and now Aaron begins to lie. He begins, oh, I, you know, threw it in and it came out, right? Threw, in, threw all this into the fire and it came right out. That's not, it says right there he took a tool and did it with his own hand. And so we find this begins to progress to the point where it's not only just a wor system of worship, but a system of lies. And what's one of the biggest lies? These are your gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The golden calf. This false system is set up in place of what God has set up. And in that sense, it's the spirit of Antichrist. In place of means is anti. And so we see the struggle continues beyond that. And we're going to come back to the golden calf in a few minutes. Nadab and Abihu in Numbers chapter 3, verse 4, we see that story emerging there of the strange fire. And obviously then two different types of faith in that time as well. There was the holy fire, there was the holy ways of doing things, and they went a different route. It's more than just someone disobeying their parents or, or, or having some weird instance in the temple. It's beyond that. It's, it's a faith emerging. In Achan's day, in Joshua's day, the reason why his whole household has to be put under and be killed is because he's permeated his whole household and he's going to eventually permeate the camp of Israel with this idea of covetousness and truly distrust of God's word when God said don't take anything from those nations. And by the way, what was he taking into his home? Things from the pagan nations all around him. And so Achan in Joshua's day, I couldn't find a whole lot in Joshua's day because Joshua was focused on the extinction of the pagan nations. And if you struggle with that, then all you got to do, just do me a favor, go look, up, go look up some of those heathen nations and their practices with their children and you will see exactly why they needed to be wiped out. Especially Molech. And in Judges' time, we find it progresses to the point where people are doing what is right in their own sight. God raises certain people up from time to time to counteract that, which obviously means they have a system that's going in the wrong direction. God's trying to get them back in the right direction. He uses men, women, uh, all kinds of people in Israel to try to get them all back. And we know he eventually sends the prophets, such as Samuel. And Samuel, one of the main prophets leading up to the monarchy, keeps trying to call them back to God. Even with Saul, uh, he points out to Saul how this is the way you are, but this is the way God is. God's not a man that he should change his mind. Look at you. And this is the way that he should have gone. We go all the way down to Elijah's time. That's a major story in the Old Testament of, of choosing if the Lord is God, follow him. If not, then follow Baal. We find there's two choices. And so they had to make a choice in those days. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, and in 2 Kings chapter 10, we talk about Jeroboam establishing a false system of worship that lasted beyond Baal worship, because Baal worship was exterminated at a certain point, but in its place was not just the most high worship. We find another variant comes out here. In 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord. So they're going to turn back and, and not become, be a part of our nation. Even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So Jeroboam, who had been a court official in Solomon's day, he begins to notice a problem. If they all go back to Jerusalem, they're going to go back and be under that rulership. I must get rid of that. And how does he do it? He sets up his golden calves, which goes back to the Egyptian story, which goes back to the same type of scenario we see in the garden. And he takes counsel, not from the Word of God. He doesn't take counsel from the Word of God, but he takes counsel amongst himself, makes two calves of gold, says to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. So it's a matter of convenience, right? It'd be easier for you just to stay here. Behold, look, here's your gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. That's a total lie. It wasn't Moses that brought him up. It wasn't the golden calves that brought him up. It wasn't any human instrumentality. It was God himself. 
And so we find this land of Egypt, which has its own weird view of life after death as well. So they don't follow the word of the Lord. They eventually will undermine any prophet that comes amongst them. They want to seize them. We find records of that. And they set up this false belief of origins. He didn't come into being from God bringing you out of Egypt. These gods brought you out of the land of Egypt. They're the ones who have saved you. And so they have this creator of our world, the universe, being replaced with a calf and a system develops in that area. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one, even into Dan. They would, go, they would even go as far away as going to Dan instead of the one that was closest to them. It's convenient for you, yet you go here and now you've got to go over there like a pilgrimage. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. So he develops his own ministry structure. Own center of worship. Own headquarters. His own priesthood. His own teachings. His own council. Own teachings of origins. And truly, this is the same as the iceberg we've been seeing all along. Because if you look at it carefully, he's undermined the Scripture by not following the Scriptures, but taking counsel in and of himself, using the excuse of convenience, he's begun to eliminate the need to go to Jerusalem and listen to anybody who's telling truth. And we find record of his time period where he'd want to seize prophets. And he has a false teaching about origins. These gods led you out of Egypt. And where do those gods come from, the golden calves? We find they're present in Egypt as well. So who was the one who originated the nation? It wasn't God. It was really Egypt. It's pointing them back to Egypt. It goes all the way back. The Egyptian religion goes all the way back. If you, and I'm not saying you should, but I've read parts of their book of the dead for a class, and it, it has this strange belief that somehow you have life in and of yourself apart from the God of the universe. You have to do certain things to, to go on into the afterlife, but it's this strange view of origins, which the whole book of Genesis contradicts. And then the false teaching about the church. We find the whole priesthood was set up in Bethel and Dan. If that's not a false system, if that's not a false church, I don't know what is. It's an ancient way of saying a whole worship system was set up. That's a false church. And that undermines the Creator Himself, Jesus Christ. I wish to tell you it would stop there, but it continues. 2 Kings chapter 10, Jehu slays the lineage of Ahab. He gets rid of the worshipers of Baal, destroys the Baal worship system totally, which had already begun to be destroyed previously, but the calves still remain. They remain as a worship system in place of the one that God established in Jerusalem, and this leads up to Babylonian captivity, which you've been studying about in your Sabbath school lesson. And what do we know from that record? Most went into Babylon. Few relatively speaking, came out of Babylon. So it's a sad story in 1 Kings chapter 12 and 2 Kings 10, 10 of this worship system being established. I wish to tell you that it, it faded after they came back from Jerusalem, excuse me, from Babylon to Jerusalem. But we find similar practices in the Maccabee, Maccabean period, weird beliefs of life after death in those books, and eventually Hellenistic views. Because when they go into Babylonian captivity, they lose the language... And as a result, you find translations, Greek translations, which are known as Septuagint, having to be translated from the Hebrew to Greek because they don't even know the language anymore. And we get down through the Greek period, and we know by the time of Jesus' day, they're worshiping a temple, they're worshiping the day of worship more than the Creator Himself. There's all kinds of weird views. They've got this whole rich man and Lazarus type teaching that's circulating about life after death. You find the priests themselves and the, the religious leaders have all kinds of views of life after death. Some don't even believe in a resurrection. And who do they end up worshiping? Not the Creator. And that's why your Scripture reading shows Jesus is trying to talk to them and say, you search the Scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life. They believe that the Scriptures were given to them by the grace of God, and if somehow they memorized them enough, or somehow if they kept them perfectly, then that's all they needed. But Jesus is saying, they testify of me. They testify of me. Jesus is telling them, you need me. And so even in Jesus' day, they had a problem. They had a system set up in place of, in place of 
true creator worship. I'm not saying that everything they taught was false, but there is enough in the rabbinical teachings to see that they were off in quite a few areas. And so, is the iceberg here today? Is there an undermining of Scripture in the Christian church? Yes, and it's coming to the Adventist church. Is there messenger assassination, getting rid of those who try to speak for truth, not just in times of communism in Romania? Yes, they get rid of them. And the biggest one they try to get rid of is Ellen White. Is there a false teaching about origins trying to permeate our church? Yes, Mac Revolution is trying to permeate our church. All you do is go south of here and you'll see that. Is there a false teaching about the church itself? Yes, there is a system being set up that does all the above and eventually replaces sharing the message of Jesus with community activism only. So, am I concerned about this? Yes. But I know how to answer all this because if you stick something in place of Jesus, all I got to do is kick that out of the way and re-lift up Jesus. That's easy to do. From Sabbath to Sabbath, let's lift up Jesus Christ. And from day to day in our homes, let's, let's point ourselves to Him. Spend that time in devotions with Him. If you know the true, you don't even have to worry about the counterfeit. If you focus on Him. And so I did a little graph here. And for those of you who are taking pictures or trying to jot it down, what it's going to be is um, Jaron's doing an excellent job of putting these slides on the video on the internet. So we have a YouTube channel and you'll be able to see all of this. And if you want it emailed to you, then just send me an email or call my office and leave a message and I'll try to email it to you. But in the garden, we had a distrust of the words of God, hath God said. No need for God, you will be as him. False teaching of origins, you are God. A system was set up, eat this fruit. In other words, taste and be a part of my system. And throughout the Old Testament, we have the idea of take counsel amongst themselves. They did what was right in their own sight. They eliminated the prophets. They believe they came from Egypt. Whole weird view of origins there. And a system was set up of calves and idols. And you, you all just go through the Old Testament, you know. It's amazing to see how these things were somehow, somehow enchanting the people. New Testament, they chose convenient scriptures that didn't even believe in a, a suffering Messiah. So they chose the conquering Messiah part and they neglected that one. Some believed in weird views about resurrection. They eventually eliminate the Messiah himself. They don't accept Jesus as the creator. They focus on temple worship rather than Jesus worship. And as a result, they even stone the last prophet that was sent to them, Stephen himself. In our day, we have the higher critical method, people picking and choosing scriptures. Some will even say, this one's not an issue of salvation or that's not an issue of salvation. I understand that, but I don't have a menu in my hand here. I have a message from God here. All of it. All Scripture is God-breathed. He took human beings, and just like He did that miracle of breathing life into Adam, we find He does the same thing through the words of God. He's breathed something into this. You read the pages of this book, and even some of the parts you think are boring, you start looking at them, analyzing them, and you start noticing God's perfect plan for us. His wonderful message for us. All Scripture is is God breathed. I can't use it as a menu. I have to maybe take certain portions each day. That, that's as close as you get to a menu. But as far as picking and choosing, well, I don't like eggplant, so I'll leave Leviticus alone. So you can't, you don't do that. Leviticus points to Jesus in so many ways, and then probably next year or two we'll, we'll look at just Leviticus for a while. But this is what's going on now. They want to eliminate and pick and choose, eliminate the messengers which if you eliminate the messengers who are pointing you to the messenger, then eventually some people are not looking to the messenger. You can never eliminate the messenger himself. That's Jesus. He's the messenger of the covenant. You can't get rid of him, but you can try to put things in place and, and crowd him all up so you can't see him. And then as far as the false teaching of origins, we have that clearly. Evolution and pantheism has been diagnosed as the alpha in our church that was coming in 1904 and so we have been, been combating that for a long time because we believe in, in a literal creation week and we believe that God has a seventh-day Sabbath where he calls together his human family and in Ephesians 1, his heavenly family to worship together by faith. And so evolution and pantheism short-circuits that. And then is a system set up to counter all the Bible-believing churches? Yes. All Bible-believing churches 
Seventh-day Adventists, and there are some people who are searching dearly in other churches, will have to counteract this. Go to, go to churches and start evaluating. Do they uphold the Bible? The Bible. Do they believe in messengers or, or the gifts of the Spirit? Do they believe in creation, the way the Bible teaches, including the Sabbath? You'll start watching. A system has been set up throughout Christendom that must be taken down. And we've been warned of this, especially in the Seventh-day Adventist church. I read quotations like this. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Now these, these doctrines, we call them 27 or 28 fundamental beliefs, the, if you look at them carefully, they all point you to Jesus in some way. So if you start taking away that, you're putting something else in place and you don't see Jesus anymore. And engaging in a process of reorganization, were this reformation to take place, what would result? Well, the principles of truth that God in his wisdom had given to the remnant church would be discarded. I don't use the word remnant to get prideful about our church, but it's, it's, there's very few churches remaining, if that's the word remnant, remaining that are trying to lift up our Creator the way we do. That's just the reality. I've looked, I remember uh, when I first started going and attending a Seventh-day Adventist church, I went to the Seventh-day Adventist church, and then I went to all kinds of churches and compared, and I just couldn't find one that was lifting up the Creator the way you all did. And as I looked, that's what I was looking for, consistency. Not tell me in Sunday school to memorize the Ten Commandments, and then when I get to my Get later on in life, you tell me some of them are optional. I want to have consistency. In fact, that's what our young people are looking for today. They want some consistency with all this chaos that's going on. And so, to get rid of the principles of the truth of God, when we say remnant church, we're talking about God's people who are remaining faithful to the words of God. And as a church, so far I have found the Adventist church has done well in that. You've had some hiccups every once in a while, but overall, done well. And we would discard those. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years, she's writing 1904, so you subtract that, you're looking at a period of time in the 1800s, would be accounted as error. You all have lived here longer than I have in California. You know that's already taken place because of all kinds of weird beliefs that you've had to face. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. And this is happening today even more so than just evolution being taught and introduced to our young people in our universities as something to be aware of. Some are teaching it as if it's fact. But my little boys and I can tell you, as you watch these movies about nature, and they start going on about millions of years, and then they talk about how volcanism and flooding had something to do with it, you say to yourself, does volcanism and flooding have something to do with eliminating some of these long dates? Yes, they found it does. And so they, there's this contradictory going on there where you, people want to conform to the culture and the things of their day, and so they start reading that into Scripture, and that's not true. It's not a fact. The fact is, we don't know things. And the more we think we know, the more we realize we don't know. It's like you figure out, some certain mathematical equations, and then you realize it's more complicated than that, and they look up at the stars, and it's even more complicated than that. And you start getting into the ocean, and you start discovering organism after organism you never even knew existed before. And so the reality of it is we just don't know everything. And so I would rather trust a source that has been consistent over time, and it shows someone who does know everything, not because he's being proud about it, but because he's trying to impart life-giving love and message of love to us. I'd rather trust him. And so, with all due respect, the ones who are engaging and teaching evolution as a fact to our young people will have a millstone hung around their necks. They will not make it to the kingdom. It's not a fact. Evolution itself is pretty much a hypothesis stage. If you can't prove something, because you never witnessed the whole thing, we didn't witness the primordial soup, we didn't witness anything that happened before that, then what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a hypothesis. You have to then test the hypothesis and gather evidence, and eventually it becomes, eventually, eventually, a theory. 
But as we look, we're dealing with a hypothesis, and as Darwin and others recognized, if it was undone, it's actually shown to be nothing more than a faith. And this is undergirded by an attempt to destroy our seminary training program and put in its place a Catholic-Protestant blend. And what do I mean by that? When I'm sitting in a class and I'm told that our system of training ministers in the biblical languages and in understanding the Bible and then being, in essence, Bible teachers to our people needs to be replaced. And not only that, the word, is, the word they used was destroyed. Then red flags go off. And when I'm sitting in that class and I hear that, I start raising my hand, just like with that teacher on the community college. I'm going to raise my hand regardless of who the teacher is. And I said, what would you put in its place? And I'm told, well, the local church would, would determine its teachings and tradition, so it would become a congregational type of system. It would then have a focus on, uh, the t- ministers would learn philosophy and relational skills, and then they would learn practice, how to do ministry in that local church. With re- and I said, so what about the bigger church? And we're part of a bigger church. And we start getting into this discussion, and by the time we're done, I just was puzzled, and on the way home from that class, I was flying in an airport, and I came across a history professor from the same seminary, and I said, what would happen if we got rid of our seminary training program the way it is and put tradition, philosophy, and practice in its place and pretty much confine it to the local church level? What would, what would, be, what would, that, what would happen with that? And he's like, uh, that would totally destroy our system. And this is a history professor and the Lord put him right in my path as I'm leaving that class, going home to here. And he's like, well, why? And I said, well, that's what I learned in class the day before yesterday. And he was disturbed. And then I met somebody who, who uh, teaches practice at the seminary on the same air, airport. And as uh, he was in first class, because he flies all the time as a professor, and I'm just a student, so I'm back there. And I'm hearing them discuss this, what I've just talked about. And then as we're getting off the airplane... I say, uh, Brother Kidder, that's his name, Dr. Kidder, how would you feel if, the, if we as, as a people just focused on meeting the needs of the community only? In other words, we don't ever really share anything about our message. Uh, he's like, well, that, I mean, we need to do both. Why, why don't we meet needs and then share the message when people are open to hearing the message? Why don't we do both? He's like, well, I don't understand why they're against each other. And he asked me why, and I told him why, and that was because I had just heard in a class that we really should not be proclaiming through Revelation seminars and things like this our message, we should be just doing community activism. And he was disturbed. And I said, well, i got to go, because he thought my, his bag would get there before mine. Mine got there. And I, I, I walked off it. We uh, chatted a little bit more down the runway, and the reality of it is, is this is what's being introduced. And so there is an undermining taking place where it's telling us not to share our message, but just engage in community activism. And you're going to notice that the North American Division is going to roll this out soon. In fact, it's already in one of your magazines this week. So I'm not telling you that your church is bogus or anything. I'm just saying you need to stand firm for the Word of God no matter who's rolling things out to you. And if this attack's happening in the Seventh-day Adventist church, I can imagine what's happening in other churches already. Some have already buckled to evolution, and some have already buckled to the idea of undermining Scripture. And really, you remain. You need to stand firm. You need to have personal devotions with Jesus, so when somebody comes to you and introduces something to you, you can say, well, what does that have to do with Jesus? You know, should I just learn philosophy when in Jesus' day he said, I'm the Word? He's the total logos? He's really what all all wisdom is pointing to anyway? No, I mean, just the teaching of Jesus contradicts all these things. And then there will be a goal to separate and doubt the world church that's already underway. And it's already been begun to happen in a couple of conferences. It's not official, but it's already, the seed's already being planted for that. And so you need to hold fast, pray for your leaders and your pastors and others who are saying, you know what, we have a message And some people may have gotten dogmatic and way off onto some little proof text years ago, but we have a solid message that has its foundation in Jesus Christ. We are going to hold to it no matter what. We're going to proclaim Jesus through this message. And he is the creator and the source of wisdom, not us. Shortly before I sent out the testimonies, this is that same iceberg text, 
regarding the efforts of the enemy to undermine the foundation of our faith through the dis dissemination of seductive theories, I had read an incident about a ship in a fog meeting an iceberg. For several nights I slept but little. I seemed to be bowed down as a cart beneath sheaves. One night a scene was clearly presented before me. A vessel was upon the waters. In a heavy fog, suddenly the lookout cried, Iceberg just ahead. There, towering high above the ship, was a gigantic iceberg. Imagine that, this little ship and this huge iceberg. What would you do? You'd be like the Titanic. Veer course, right, and cut your ship open like a cannon, you know? An authoritative voice cried out, Meet it. There was not a moment's hesitation. It was time for instant action. The engineer put full steam, and the man in the wheel steered the ship straight into the iceberg. So the voice that cries out full steam, then who's responding? The ones who are there need to help lead the ship and hit it. And the man at the wheel steered the ship straight into the iceberg. With a crash, she struck the, struck the ice and she broke in pieces, right? No, there was a fearful shock. The iceberg broke into many pieces, falling with a noise like thunder to the deck. Can you imagine that? You've ever been to on those tours and you hear the, I've, I've never been there, but I've heard the vi on the videos, this and then the iceberg falls down, piece of the iceberg falls down. Imagine this whole huge iceberg just crumbling, pieces going everywhere. The passengers, if you're on that cruise ship, if you will, I think more of a militant ship, but you're on that ship violently shaken around by the force of the collision, but no lives were lost on that ship. So you stay on the ship. Even if others are jumping off, you stay on it, trust the Lord's going to lead it, and meet it, meet all those things. The vessel was injured, but not beyond repair. She rebounded from the contact, trembling from stem to stern like a living creature. You can imagine the groaning and all that. Then she moved forward on her way. Who's the she in the Bible that we're talking about? In the New Testament, we find it's the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. His church will face these things, hit them, and move on her way to the heavenly promised land. So how do I meet these things? We hit them with Jesus. So if someone's undermining Scripture, I say, well, Jesus in John chapter 1 is the Word. He is the foundation for everything. If you undermine the Word of God, you're undermining my Savior. Do you want to undermine Jesus? That's the real question. Next one, if they begin to say, well, um, you can't trust uh, the gifts in the church, you know, the prophets and stuff like that. Well, as I look at it, Jesus gave the gifts. And so if he gave something to his church, then if we don't appreciate it, who are we really shaming then? We're shaming Jesus. So do you want to shame Jesus? No, I don't want to shame Jesus. I want it to be open to him sending light to our ship. And I can tell you right now, I don't have enough wisdom to steer this ship. Neither do you individually. Together we will, as we all seek the Lord for wisdom, he will steer this ship. But we need the gifts, all the gifts, to steer the ship in the right direction, including prophecy and the others. The false teaching about origins, well, flat out, who was the one who made our world? John chapter 1 tells you it was Jesus Christ himself. Without him was not anything made that was made. So if you go back to Genesis and you're slicing away at what the Creator did, then eventually what you're going to do is you're going to miss that and nick the Creator himself and leave it, and not really, but figuratively speaking, how much of Jesus do you want to cut away? Because I still remember, I know how this goes. Eventually, if you have no trust in the Word of God and it's just your own experience, then other experiences are valid besides Christianity. And I still remember looking in the mirror and telling the devil, after I had totally discarded Jesus loves me, this I know, and Psalms that I knew as a little boy, I totally discarded all of that and said to myself, God doesn't exist. I, but I eventually put something else in its place. I told the devil, I'll be the worst person you've ever seen. There's not a God in my life, but there's a devil that I want to commit to. Are you kidding me? I'm not saying everybody will go that route, but it's a dark route. It's a fearful route, and it's a route that very few come back from. And so I don't want anybody going down that route because they somehow didn't see Jesus. And so, I look at John 1. He's the creator. I don't want to undermine him in any way. I would undermine myself and say, you know what, maybe I'm the stupid scientist here and he's the one that knows everything. Maybe I need to learn something. In fact, I remember sitting in a science class at that community college with a professor, Mackey, and this guy was brilliant teaching physics, and he began to just inter 
weave. Because from a physics standpoint, the idea of order and potentially then, if it, there's all of this order, then somebody must have ordered it around and created it. And that's a Seventh-day Adventist professor on that same college campus lifting up Jesus. And the false teaching about the church, well, you know what? Our church isn't perfect. Nobody's church is. But you know what? He has led us to the point where we're at today. So I'm not willing to just totally chuck that. Because if I put something else in its place, uh, community church movement is also in your brochure, your, your magazine recently. You'll see that. Plant more community churches. Um, we are a community church. We are going to impact our community. But our focus is to help them live better lives, understand the message that will lead them to the life everlasting. And so if we set up a different church in its place and separate, it's going to set us back in the worldwide work of proclaiming the gospel. And I believe that's what, G, what Satan wants. He wants to slow down our work enough so that he will have more time to work. And so we find a system could be set up in place of Jesus, but it all begins with each one of us. I'm going to lift him up in my life, in my daily life, with my kids, with my family, here at church, and then I'm going to share him with the world around me. And if anything takes away from that, then basically it can go on down the road. It can find another church. Because God will put the people here who need to be here and who will want to worship the Creator together. He's our foundation, and I'm going to look to Jesus and lift him up and not put anything in place of Jesus, for that is Antichrist. So our foundation is Jesus Christ, and I'm going to invite our song uh, players, our pianists and organists, to come up and to lead us through the song. And this is the last time we're going to sing it for a little while. It's called, uh, we have one foundation, and it's Jesus Christ. It'll be up on the screen. And you can stand if you'd like to, and, and when you sing in this song, just say, Lord, what would you have me to stand for at this time? Number 348, the church has one foundation. Number 348. church has one foundation, tis Jesus Christ to Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to meet his holy bride. With his own blood he bought and for her life he died. He lacked from every nation, yet one or all the earth. The charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed, no foes would rend asunder the rock where she doth rest. Yet saints her faith shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with a vision glorious her longing eyes are church victorious shall be the church at rest. Let's pray. Father, 
Please forgive me for times where I've been just totally oblivious to what's going on. And if you've wakened me up to this now, I pray, Lord, you'll keep me faithfully in my study at your feet, Jesus, so I can see clearly anything that takes away from you. And so may the word of life himself, Jesus himself, show himself to each one of us, keep us faithfully on this path, hit the iceberg head on until, and go beyond into that beautiful, glorious land and be with him face to face. In his name I pray, amen.